There once lived a king who decided to give a large sum of gold to the artist who could paint the most accurate image of peace. And artists from everywhere in the king's kingdom sent their work to the castle to be judged. Among the many masterpieces, one depicted a smooth lake, clear as glass, reflecting towering snow-capped mountains beneath a beautiful blue sky overhead. The picture was exemplary, a perfect depiction of peace. The king's judges debated amongst themselves and were in agreement that this was the top contender. But the king himself had another painting in mind. To the judge's surprise, the picture that the king picked showed a rugged landscape shrouded in the darkness of late autumn. The sky looming above in the scene was dark and foreboding, spewing icy rain with lightning flashing angrily across it between the pale clouds. The judges were upset by the king's choice. To them and many other bystanders, the painting had nothing to do with the theme of peace at all. What no one but the king noticed, though, was that there in the painting he picked, near the bottom, was a tiny tree growing out of the barren ground. And there under the tree was a nest built by a mother bird, braving the icy storm with her children underneath her. It seems that peace is much more than beautiful scenery. If you were asked to paint a picture of peace today, what would your painting look like? Would you paint a world without war, a nation without poverty, maybe a quiet house at the end of a long day? or your favorite chair with your favorite book and a cup of your favorite coffee. Maybe you would paint a campfire with friends around it, all drinking your favorite beer. What would your painting of peace look like? When we think of the word peace, we all have different images that come to mind. Today is the first Sunday of the Advent season, and I want to talk about peace for a few minutes. What it is, what it's not, and how we bring it about in this world. Adventus, of course, is the Latin word where we get our English word Advent, and it means approach or anticipation. And so the season of Advent is a time of waiting and expectation before Christmas Day arrives, where we remember the Christ being born into our own paintings, if you will, our own landscapes, showing us better ways to live, believe, and behave. This year for Advent, we are studying through some passages from the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. And today's passage says this. It's found in the second chapter, verses 2 through 5. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of all the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of God. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from heaven, the word of the Lord from the city. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Even though the word peace isn't specifically mentioned in this text, we see it here in the midst of all of the high speech and religious metaphor. Much like the bird in the king's painting, 
We only find the peace amidst tragic surroundings. But it's there, and it's the point of the whole thing. We see this most clearly in the fourth verse that reads, God will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Now here is today's unpopular lesson. Did you know that this passage teaches us that peace actually begins with judgment? Like in the painting, this is the seemingly ugly, tragic scenery that makes up most of the painting except for that one little peaceful part with the birds in the corner. Yes, peace begins with judgment. However, by judgment, I don't mean that in the petty sense. I'm not talking about judging others because we don't like their friends or their personality or their tastes or their preferences. No, this passage is talking about the deliberate condition of our collective consciousness as a species and how we must choose a world that doesn't become something less peaceful. And in this, yes, peace can only begin by making good judgments. Good judgment calls between what is right, that is what is good for everyone, and what is wrong, that is what is only good for some. That is what is meant by judgment here in this passage. Peace is never brought about by turning a blind eye to tyrants and despots. Peace never comes by demanding that one group's preferences be the principles of every other group. And yes, peace never comes by giving the squeakiest wheel all of the grease at the neglect of the entire machine. And so many people will never make this leap in consciousness. This is why the passage also says that God's judgment will settle the disputes of many, not all. This is not a popular take on the topic of peace, but it is what the scriptures teach us. During this broadcast every week, I always ask you to write something down to remember to take into the coming week with you. And here's what I'd like you to remember for today. Peace looks like no one getting everything that they want so that everyone can have what they need. Again, peace looks like no one getting everything that they want so that everyone can have what they need need. Needs and wants. Needs and wants. The distinction between what we really need and what we want. So very, very important for us to know the difference between these two things. What are you upset about in your life today? Who are you upset at in your life today? Are you experiencing those things because you're not getting something that you really need? Or is it just because you're not getting what you want? You know, in counseling circles, it's common when sitting with couples to ask each of them what they want as individuals in the relationship. And I have almost every time found that method to be more of a brick wall than an open door for the couple. Instead, what I often ask couples to voice aloud is, and they have to think about their answer for a minute. I ask them to voice aloud, what do you want your partner to want? What do you want your partner to want? Why do I ask this? 
because it gets at the real issue that's keeping them from experiencing peace. It evokes a response that can actually help them work on the relationship together. And when they do answer this question honestly, there is almost immediately progress, even if it's painful progress, because they both start seeing the absurdity of trying to control what someone else wants. And when that is recognized, then the couples can see what the relationship needs, and then they can choose whether or not to work on that together. How we handle what our relationships with others are in need of makes or breaks the entire world. What you do as an individual gets added to that of other individuals. And before we know it, there are billions of people changing the world for better or for worse. Simply how we discern between our needs and our wants. And it is in this place that God is trying to get to in us. It is for this reason that the Christ, the Prince of Peace, as Scripture calls him, comes into the world at Christmas. So that we will begin the difficult but noble work of peacemaking of becoming more peaceful people, not just as individuals, but as a society, as a nation, as a world. A people who understand deeply that peace looks like no one getting everything that they want so that everyone can get what they need. What no one but the king noticed, though, was that there in the painting near the bottom was a tiny tree growing out of the barren ground. There under the tree was a nest built by a mother bird, braving the storm with her children underneath her. It seems that peace is much more than beautiful scenery. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of God. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from heaven, the word of the Lord from the city. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many people. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. I want to invite you now to spend a few moments in quiet reflection, just allowing everything that we've heard here today to take shape in your heart. If you would like to receive the Eucharist with us while you're doing that, you can gather the elements at this time. But let's take a few moments to meditate on the peace of God within us and happening all over the world by how we differentiate between what we want and what we need so that we can have a world where everyone gets what they need. Amen. <laughs>